I think there's a high probability that the currencies and credit are going to get destroyed. We live in an everything bubble that's sovereign debt and currencies and credit. They are trapped and they're, you know, on one side is massive deflation and on the other side is massive inflation. And they've managed to walk down this thin line for a while now, but they're going to get shoved off the line pretty soon. So, it, you know, to me, it's the best asymmetric bet I've seen in 43 years of investing. But like I say, I haven't given up my gold because, you know, I, I have a really good friend. He said, gold is a CDS on Bitcoin's failure, right? I mean, you know, what a, a CDS is a credit default swap, right? And so if Bitcoin doesn't work, you want to own a ton of gold. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the Ed JR Mining Guy over on X and of course, your host of this channel. And I'm looking forward to welcoming back an old friend of the channel. It's Larry Apart. He's a managing partner over at Equity Management Associates and uh, somebody I've been looking forward to catching up with because uh, he's got a bifurcated view. In a, in a positive way, because uh, he's in the gold and the Bitcoin camp, and I'm looking forward to getting his opinion on both today. Like personally, as you know, I'm not a Bitcoin expert, but I tolerate it. I don't mind Bitcoin at all, and I'm happy to catch up uh, with Larry about it because I'm curious wh where's Bitcoin going, like what and uh, what is it taking away from gold, perhaps. So I'm trying to understand that correlation a little bit, and then I'll, I'll explore it with Larry. Um, we'll have some other topics, of course, to discuss, like impact of the U.S. elections on the on sound money, the announcement of a new U.S. Treasury Secretary come January, what's the impact there, and, of course, lots of other things uh, we, we need to break down here together. Before I switch over to my guest, hit that like and subscribe button. It is your free way to support us, and we tremendously appreciate it. Now, without much further ado, Larry, it is great to see you again. Thanks so much for joining Good me. Good to see you, Kai. I am uh, always enjoy being on your program, so looking forward to this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we, we you know we just uh, caught up here for a few short seconds. I think we'll easily fill 40, 45 minutes here. Oh, yeah, problem. no problem. <laughs> um, let, let's start with a bit of an icebreaker and uh, set, the, set the scene a little bit. And uh, maybe opening question for you today, Larry, is like how important was the U.S. election for the future of sound money? Yeah, well, just in general, the U.S. election was enormously important, you know, I think for the U.S. And then I, that translates into sound money just because it, it stopped or slowed down the decay towards socialism and, you know, um, a lot of bad thought patterns that were, you know, in the Democratic administration, the Democratic alternative. So, um, so on, on balance, it's a, it's a big positive, I think, for, for the United States. Um, as, as regards sound money and, and how it impacts it, I think, I think it's generally speaking a net positive. Um, you know, they're, they're the, and, and we'll talk about the treasury sec pick in a minute, but, um, you know, the, the, uh, there are those who say it, it's not positive for sound money because they they basically want to, you know, part of the sound money thesis, as we all know, is that the government's out of control and they're going to spend a ton of money and they're going to print to spend. And so one could argue that, you know, um, by letting uh, the Democrats ruin the country, um, you know, and, and spend like they have been spending, that would be better for the sound money thesis. And and, and that may be true. But um, but I, my view is actually that, that almost either side, there's only so much either side can do. And you know, the, as you're, I'm sure you're aware over there in Europe, there's a, uh, the big talk has been about this Doge committee, the Department of Government um, Efficiency that uh, Elon and Vivek Ramaswamy are, are, are talking about. And there's, you know, they're hyping the notion that they can cut $2 trillion in expenses and balance the budget and so on and so forth. And, and that's just a fantasy. I mean, I'm not, I'm not opposed to what they're trying to do. I'm just suggesting that they can't do what they've, this is like Elon, you know, and Elon's a big thinker with some great ideas. Uh, but he tends to, you know, have eyes that are larger than what he can deliver sometimes. And so, you know, if you look at the United States fiscal situation, 80 percent of the expenses are and things that are going to be extremely hard to cut. Social Security, Medicare, insurance, um, interest costs and defense. The other 20 percent. So let's say you go and you whack that really hard, get 30 percent of it. Well, that's only 270 billion dollars a year that you save. And last year, the deficit was one point eight trillion. And if you annualize the deficit run rate for the last six months, it's running at 2.4 trillion. So what that suggests is that if we cut 270, we're only taking 4% off the top and we're running a deficit of north of $2 trillion at this rate, actually well north of $2 trillion. So, so the point is the notion that, that this Trump administration, these Doge guys can get us out of this fiscal mess that we're in, while they can slow it down, they can't get us out of it. And so the sound money trade, I think, continues to be a very good place to be. Um, and I would argue that this team with a new treasury pick, and maybe we can go there, 
um, is is better suited to try and work through the tricky problems that we have here. I mean, my partner likes to say that this thing, my partner in business, David Foley, likes to say that, you know, the U.S. fiscal situation is such a mess that it's going to be like brain surgery to get this thing, you know, to get the country, to hold the country together and solve it. And, uh, you know, the one thing I will say about Scott Besant is that he's a very smart guy. And, um, you know, I think he will... And I, and I think he's aligned with the interests of, of Trump and, and the, those in the administration who want to, you know, kind of reshore our industry and use tariffs selectively and aggressively and, and drill for more oil and, and really kind of take an America first approach as opposed to an internationalist approach. And the, you know, the, the Biden administration, the Democrats, you know, um, who all support CBDCs and, you know, international initiatives. Um, really kind of put Americans in the, in the back seat. And um, there was a great New York Times article. The title of it was, um, you know, can you hear us now? And, and it was, you know, the, you know, the working class Americans all over the country came out to this election and said, you know what? We don't like what you're doing to us. You know, we want you to put America first. We want you to stop the immigration. We want illegal immigration. We want you to, you know, reshore our industry. Um, you know, we should be thinking about ourselves we want you to stop sending money to foreign countries. Uh, we want you to stop the wars, and um, and so that's why Trump got an overwhelming mandate. And uh, I think on balance, it's good for the country. But I think with respect to the the sound money trade, as I said earlier, the fiscal situation is dire. And while they can make a dent in it, and that's probably a positive, I don't think they can solve it. Um, so yeah. Yeah, the, the horse is already dead, I think, sadly. It's in a lot of trouble. I mean, what they could do that would be intelligent is they could do a structured reset rather than letting it kind of spin out of control. You know, they should do something akin to what Roosevelt did, where they do a, a, a devaluation and then return to sound money. I mean, the, the issue, as you and I both know, and all gold investors know, is the money's not sound. and It's getting worse. And we've got to reverse that trend. And it's like drinking, you know, you've got to sober up. You can't just keep drinking to solve each hangover. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's going to be painful, that sobering up process. But on the other side of that, if the money is sound, you know, there's a lot of good, great technology, a lot of great people. If we can avoid a war, you know, things will get good quickly, in my opinion. But uh, to get from here to there, you know, there's going to be a lot of turbulence in the next couple of years. We sell gold and silver, but we're also, and most importantly, we're in the credibility and trust business. We do everything we say we're gonna do. We ship timely, we communicate well. It's a nerve wracking process for many folks, especially the first time they're investing in precious metals. And it's a big goal of ours to make folks comfortable when they're making this kind of investment and making this kind of decision for themselves. Money Metals offers all of the offerings that somebody interested in precious metals needs. We provide great pricing, fast delivery. We have a fully integrated storage offering. We provide a loan program for people that want to borrow against their gold and silver for business purposes. We have a monthly purchase plan that allows people to put their investing on autopilot. We advocate for gold and silver public policy around the country. We're the only ones doing that. We're advocating for our customers because we believe in our product and we are aligned with our customers. We are the most prolific publisher of precious metals content in our industry. We are a one-stop shop for precious metals, all under one roof. No, hundred percent. Uh, uh, let, let's stay on the Treasury Secretary for one second. Uh, sure, Scott Pesant. Sure. I've been hearing some interesting commentary about his policies and what he stands for. And one one thing I was mentioned also at our conference last weekend uh, was that he's fairly close uh, or likes the ideologies of Shinzo Abe, former Japanese Prime Minister, and yes. that he could take uh, or would support low interest to zero interest rates and just continue a debt monetization, meaning the Fed could potentially buy the Treasury debt. Is that something you're fearing as well? Because that's something I've been personally sort of, I wouldn't say predicting, but ex almost expecting well, I, I, where the U.S. might I, I go. Think, I think they kind of have to do it. You know, he has this 333 program. I, I, I think he basically, I think they basically, I mean, the problem, let's boil, boil it down. Let's go back to first principles. Kai. The problem is the debt to GDP ratio is just way too high, right? Um, and, and getting worse. And so, and what Powell did actually, you know, it, it maybe solved the inflation problem a bit, although 
one could argue the inflation might have gone away without Powell doing what he did. But um, but what they really need to do is they need to grow GDP. They need to aggressively grow GDP. And that can happen through productivity. That can happen through deregulation, which they're going to push. That can happen you know, by opening up more drilling and, and being more energy independent, bringing the cost of energy down, which I think they will do. And all those things are very good. Um, but it also can happen by keeping interest rates artificially low and letting inflation run hot. And while, you know, uh, while I think that, the, the, you know, the populace will complain about the inflation, as long as the economy is humming and people have jobs, my sense is people are going to be able to, they're going to tolerate it. At least I hope that's the case, because, because really the, that's, that's the only alternative they have other than doing kind of a global reset. Um, and so, and I don't think, you know, they or the population are ready for that yet. They could be, but I don't think they are. So... You know, my sense is what they've got to do is, you know, they've got to they've got to stop spending money on wasteful things and on regulation and on, you know, the Inflation Reduction Reduction Act and spend it on things that add to our infrastructure and grow American industry. The other thing, he hasn't talked about it much and he said he's a strong dollar guy, but I don't believe it. I actually think that a part of the action with the threatened tariffs, et cetera, is that they, they want to decrease the value of the dollar try and make U.S. goods more competitive worldwide and try and make it, you know, try and slow down the trade deficits, which have been kind of continually growing. So, you know, my sense is that they're they're going to basically change. A lot is going to change with this administration. Um, and one could argue, I was talking about this in another podcast recently, one could argue that, you know, it's, it's going to be pretty quick because, you know, in the United States, I mean, you have the midterms in two years and then you'll have J.D. Vance running as president in four years, and you want to have things looking better by the time that occurs. So like a company that has a bad quarter, it's kind of it's sometimes better to kitchen sink it and, you know, take all the pain right up front <laughs> when there's no voter to throw you out. And then hopefully things will be better in two years and much better in four years. So I, I, one could argue that they're going to they're going to do some pretty you know, they mean what they say. They're going to do some pretty radical things in the next six months. Yeah. Sure. No, I'm yeah. absolutely like no, I'm back like you you froze for a second, but um right. the US dollar I think is an interesting one because if you look at Japan and that model low low interest rates, decently high inflation, the yen completely disappeared from the world stage. It's only been right. used for the carry trade, borrow cheaply to buy something else with it and then uh, right. generate returns elsewhere. Um how long does the US have when when they were go Let's assume they go down this route. Let's say we're going to push interest rates lower. Inflation is going to run higher. Maybe the Fed starts monetizing the, the treasury debt and starts buying it. It's not like they haven't done it before. But uh, let, let's assume they go down that route. How, how long does the U.S. have as still or the U.S. dollar has uh, as a world reserve currency? It feels well, like they, they try maybe give it two, three years, maybe two years, and then we'll focus on the dollar again. Um, is, yeah. is that a valid thesis? Like, are they well, I, I maybe... think the dollar is going to be the dollar is going to be around for a long time. I mean, don't get me wrong. As a payment, as a payment rail, the dollar will be along around for a long time. The more interesting question is how long does the U.S. bond market have? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and, and is is the U.S. bond ever going to become a you know a reserve asset again? And I think it's in the process of losing that status, and it's going to completely lose it as they're forced to print and institute QE and and ZERP again, which I think they will be forced into. With the next market downturn, which you know, in my book, is coming relatively soon, and I say that because I think you know the employment numbers are about to be bad, and the economy is about to roll over. Um, but back to you know the reserve currency piece. I mean, there's there are numbers showing now how much trade is being done outside the dollar, and it's significant and and growing rapidly. I mean, the, there's a great chart by Balaji on Twitter showing that the Chinese. Uh, yuan is is now you know that used dollar dollar imports or dollar you know Chinese trade you know used to be done you know ninety percent in dollars and that's significantly slipped closer to seventy percent today so uh, and and the trend is strong against the dollar so um, look I I think it's good that we have multiple currencies and that we move toward a more balanced trade picture where there are neutral reserve currencies and. And honestly, I think that's part of what supported the breakout in gold from 2070 to what well, was 2700. Now it's closer to 25 or 26. But but that's a still even if we close the year at gold at 25, that's a big up year for gold. 
big. And, and to me, that's all occurring because what's emerging is that, you know, everyone's beginning to realize all these currencies are flawed and they want to be, you know, storing value and the bond and by extension, then the bonds are flawed. And so they want to be storing their value in something that can't be printed by governments. And, and gold is kind of the obvious thing that, that fits in that bucket. So it seems like central banks in the east in particular slowed down their buying in recent weeks and i'm curious um like what, what are they waiting for now is it has it yeah, gotten too expensive no, for them because they were that. price I mean, agnostic right yeah i don't i don't look so much at you know at, at week to week or month to month i look at kind of year to year and they've been trending up but, but we know that some of these banks are pretty you know they're, they're, they're sensible i mean i think let me say this i think there are a lot of people and you, you can see this on bloomberg when you go and you run you know you ask for the the five-year out gold projections and it's still kind of, and this is why that by the way the gold stocks trade so poorly there's still a lot of consensus or belief that this 25 26 27 is just kind of a you know a one-time thing and it's not going to stay there and i think most of the banks and a lot of the analysts are projecting gold prices five years out of 2050 2100 1900 1800 i mean i think the mean was like 2050 and so you know, I, I guess the central banks probably are, are thinking in the same way, which is, well, if it's a 2,500, 26, a little too expensive, let's wait until it comes back in. My view is it's not going to come back in. <laughs> My view is that we've got, you know, we've got a key fundamental shift going on here as a result of, you know, the, the realization that these companies, countries are in fiscal dominance. And, and so what gold does, as you, you and I both know, is it's, it's very good at smelling out or or teasing out future monetary debasement. So even though right now the central banks don't have the money print around full speed, gold knows that they're going to have to turn it on. <laughs> and that's why gold <laughs> is trading the way it's trading. And so my projection three, five years out on gold is gold will be somewhere between three and 7,000, um, you know, as opposed to today's 2,500. And of course, and I think the, the world will come to see that, but it's going to take, you know, I mean, we're in a correction right now. We hit what twenty seven hundred U.S. dollars, twenty seven hundred. We're coming back in. I don't know. The, today we got hammered pretty hard as we as we speak. Yeah, I've got it at twenty six thirty. It's down eighty bucks today. But but the point is, you know, whenever this correction ends, um, if you know, and, it's, and we start going north again, I think, and we, we take out the twenty seven high, people are gonna. I think there's gonna be kind of an aha moment where everyone's going, oh, this is different. We really are in a bull market for this stuff, and the reason is, you know, the. The governments are being irresponsible. Now, on, on the topic of believing in higher gold prices, even the gold majors haven't really, uh, or re no. really don't believe in it yet. Because if I look yeah. at the reserve pricing, they haven't really adjusted their reserve prices. They, but the, the, price they the, use... other thing, the other thing they haven't started doing, and I'm, this is shocking me, I mean, a couple of them have done it in very small ways, is they haven't started buying the juniors and the big deposits. I mean, you know, I've got a portfolio full of companies that are trading at $15 an ounce on the ground. I mean, you can't find an ounce on the ground for $15 today. I mean, it's, you know, your drill costs are much higher than that. And, and so, you know, the majors should be using this opportunity, recognizing where we're going. They should be buying up these juniors, you know, to try and, you know, replenish their reserve stocks. And they're not. And again, I think it's because the last time they did that in 2013, 2011, they got hammered. And so they're being more cautious. And, and as you know, as I said earlier, like everybody universally is worried that maybe this price today isn't sustainable. Yeah, exactly. But uh, the chart tells a different story. We bounced off nicely to 2535. That was sort of the yeah. the line that needed to hold technically and it held for yeah. now, um, which had yeah. me quite positive and surprised. Um, yeah. I wouldn't have been surprised if gold were actually to go lower at that point because we yeah. had so much momentum. Like I wasn't too shocked by the correction, quite honestly. Um, but yeah, it helped. No, the had gotten very one-sided. I mean, all the all the sentiment indicators were at eighty or ninety percent. What's nice though is in that in the form of the I'm using the uh, Hulbert Digest in the form of that uh, index. I mean, when we came off, boy, they quickly went down to five or ten percent. I mean, the the negative sentiment became extreme very quickly. So, um, you know, which, which suggests to me, I mean, I've, I've noticed in all my years looking at markets, that markets tend to trend in the direction, in the long-term direction, and then they have sharp moves in the counter trend. So that, you know, when you're, in a, when you're in a bull market for something, you have a nice, you know, you kind of go up, 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 and then bang, you get a real scary downtrend. The bull tries to throw you off, but then you return to going up, 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 up again. And the bear, in the bear market, just the opposite. 
you know, you have the, you're going, the prices are going down, 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 and then occasionally you have a scary rally, but the rally isn't the, that's the, that's the noise, not the signal. So it, to me, Kai, we're, we're clearly in a big gold bull market that I think is going to, you know, I'm very excited about where we are right now. I mean, I'm sure a lot of gold shareholders and gold owners in general are frustrated and everything else. It's been hard. I mean, we've had, you know, three years of sideways to down action, you know, after the big burst at, coming out of COVID, but but you can just see it coming. I mean, the you know the um, you know the the monetary debasement is coming quick, in my view. <laughs> yeah, um, Larry, I have a question for you, and maybe you can help me answer it. Back in March 2022, when the Fed started raising rates, sentiment yeah. completely disappeared in the junior mining space. Oh yeah. September 18th, the Fed cut rates, and of all of a sudden, there's euphoria back in the space. So what I'm trying to understand is the correlation between the Fed and the Fed funds rate, obviously. And the yeah. junior miners. Like, I'm really trying to understand that because the miners did not react at all to 2,700 gold, like maybe a few percentage points here and there, but yeah. uh, not not as much, especially sentiment amongst the, the executive, the C-suite has changed yeah. tremendously. Can you maybe, like, maybe you have an explanation for me? <laughs> well, no, it's, you know, it's it's just it, people tend to be backward looking in their, in their looking at investment situations and the markets tend to be forward discounting. Um, and so it's going to take a little bit more time for that sentiment to change and people to realize where we're going. I mean, I, I, I've said this before in other co- podcasts. I mean, the reason the gold shares are valued where they are is what I described earlier, that the average five year out projection is gold at 2050. And as you and I both know, the all in sustaining cost of mining an ounce of gold kind of marches up pretty consistently at somewhere between eight and 10 percent a year you know, kind of the underlying rate of inflation. Um, and so, you know, people can look at that and they say, well, all right, this company's got an ASIC of 1400, the gold price is 2070, I'm making X amount or whatever it might be. Um, you know, now we're up to 2500 gold price, which means you're making a very much larger margin. But if you're coming back to 2070 over the next five years, and in turn, the 1400 gets compounded up at say 8% a year, well, your margin is going to disappear. So, you know, the, the gold mining business is a spread business, the difference between the cost of mining it and the, and the the price you sell the gold for. So you need the price that you sell the gold for to go up at greater than the rate of mining cost inflation. Um, and I think that's going to happen. I mean, it has happened. You know, companies are earning record profits right now, record profits. Um, but again, I, I think, you know, what do they say? A bull market climbs a wall of worry, you know, and... Um, we're in a gold bull market, but everybody's looking over their shoulder. You know, they're worried. I mean, look, we'll know that when we're in a when we're you know, about to hit a bear market, everyone and their brother will be talking about how it's easy to make money in gold stocks. You know, I mean, I remember, oh, I remember 29, 10, and eleven. That's how it felt. And you know, that's come. That day's coming again, but we're not there today. We're still, you know, we're still. I mean, a lot of people still have the scars from twenty eleven to twenty fifteen, where they lost a lot of money. You know, and since that time, we've slowly been crawling out of the hole. And 2019 and 2020 were pretty good. They were good for my fund. But, you know, then then things, you know, Powell started raising rates, everything calmed down. And, you know, we gave back 40, 40 plus percent of that gain, you know, over the last three years because ostensibly they've got inflation under control. I mean, the bull case for the other side is that inflation is under control. We're going to go back into a deflationary world. And why would you ever need gold? And, you know, if you believe that, and, you know, that's, then that's the correct bet to make. I just don't believe that. I don't believe that set of conditions continues. I think that we're not, you know, we're not in a, uh, a deflationary world. I think we've entered a period of inflation. The 40-year deflationary trend from the 80s to 2020 has now broken decisively. Um, you see it in the labor contracts. You see it everywhere. And you know, that's the other thing. I mean, they say they've got inflation back down to 3%, but we all know they cook the numbers. So personally and otherwise i mean i'm sure everyone listening to this has experienced the fact that inflation is a whole lot higher than three percent you know i had i had my house insurance got doubled last year so my auto insurance went up 30 percent. that's not three percent so so the fact is you know um that that all has to become more widely known and as you and i actually were talking about i think prior to the call prior to starting this you know we compete with the stock market and, you know, the stock market's been doing pretty damn well. And so, you know, your average investor has got the MAG-7, they've got the triple Qs, you know, they're in the stocks, they've made a lot of money. 
Some of them don't want to pay the capital gains tax, so they'll at least wait until early next year to sell. But even you know, most people in general I talk to who are in the stock market are like, why would I ever sell this? You know, I've, I've, I've always been rewarded. In fact, I'll, I'll buy more. I've always been rewarded for buying the dip. And that's what I'll do this time too. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I was chatting with uh, Bill Fleckenstein and uh, that episode yep. came out past Sunday and uh, we, we both sort of agreed we need to scare the 401k money into moving into other asset classes. I think that's right. I mean, we, we've seen it in the past and we know that it happens. So once the stock market starts to not perform well, and once, you know, the next leg of inflation gets going and QE and ZERP come back, you know, our stuff's going to explode. I mean, my portfolio is going to go up 100 percent. And, you know, a lot of investors who are holding those mag seven are going to say, hey, hang on a second. This, you know, I'm, these things are working over here. Our stuff's not working anymore. And so, you know, because, you know, investors, they do chase performance. I mean, they really do. So. No, 100 percent. And that's why we're doing this. And that's why I'm in our space, to be quite honest. But I'm trying to understand what is happening. Right. And yeah. uh, wh why are certain moves happening? And uh, maybe we'll we'll have to talk about the Fed real quick, because I do want to talk with you sure. about Bitcoin, because yeah. you're you're a Bitcoin expert, obviously, and I have no clue about Bitcoin personally. <laughs> um, but uh, We'll, we'll talk about the competition between gold and Bitcoin in a second, and if there is really any. But on, on, on the topic of the Fed, I touched on it earlier, but uh, we, we've seen Fed cuts in September and October. Um, and uh, no, no, sorry, not I'm making stuff up. September, we've seen a 50 basis point cut. November, we've seen 25. And now we're, we've got one more meeting to come where the market doesn't expect to cut at all. And then the next meeting is of, about a week after Trump moves into the White House. Um, give me a bit of sense of like, where, what, what is the Fed doing? What is the Fed waiting for? Um, all of a sudden, they're data dependent again, despite making announcements of two cuts. And now it's just data dependent again. Um, wh wh what are your thoughts there, Larry? Yeah, that's... Um, um... You know, it's, it's a great question. Um, I was just with Daniel D. Martino Booth down in New Orleans. And, um, you know, she said that uh, she thinks the employment numbers are about to come in extremely soft. And that therefore, the Fed staffers, are, their hair is going to be on fire that we're going into a recession. And she thinks there's absolutely no doubt they're going to cut in December. But if I looked at CME FedWatch, which I just consulted, it's got it kind of as a 50-50. It's a 52% cut, 47% don't cut. Um, you know, if you looked at it objectively, Kai, kind of using all the measures and, you know, the stock market's at record highs, employment's hanging in there. Inflation hasn't really gotten to their 2% target. It's still kind of in the high twos, low threes. They should pass on this meeting or arguably even they should raise rates. But guess what? I don't think they will. I think, I think they're cutting. And the reason he did 50 bips on that one meeting is they know they're funding a lot of their debt short term. And so... They know they need to get those short-term rates down to prevent the U.S. federal government interest expense from being too large because that drives the deficits, which, you know, it's a it's a doom loop, right? You know, more higher cost, bigger deficit, sell more debt, same size market, interest rates go up, bigger deficit, you know, blah, 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 winch, rinse, wash, repeat. So, so the Fed's kind of trapped, in my opinion, and, um, and they probably... They probably will cut, and and after that, I don't know what they'll do. I mean, I because I think inflation is going to start to come back. They'll probably continue cutting. I don't know. There's a there's a conspiracy side of me that says, well, you know, maybe what they'll do is they'll actually get tough and try to you know prevent inflation, try to raise rates again, it, knowing that when they do that, the stock market bubble will burst, and knowing that a true bursting of the stock market bubble will give them the cover they need to go back to QE and ZERP and ultimately yield curve control. Because the, you know, my view is that they are trapped and they're, you know, on one side is massive deflation and on the other side is massive inflation. And they've managed to walk down this thin line for a while now, but they're going to get shoved off the line pretty soon. And, um, and when that happens, you know, the big, I mean, we know from history that, you know, financial collapse versus print for inflation They'll pick print for inflation every time. Yeah. <laughs> We've seen that over and over again. So, and of course, when all of that happens, our stuff goes bananas. I mean, you know, gold goes to five grand, gold stocks go up three, you know, 10 X, um, et cetera. Bitcoin goes up. All, all, all alternatives will go up a lot. And, and they'll be doing all that to quote unquote, try and save the stock market. But just like in 2008 and just like in 2000, where when each of those bubbles peaked, 
they cut rates enormously and quickly. Took them all the way down to zero. It didn't help. You know, the, the, the bursting bubble, you know, created a lot of unemployment, bigger deficits. You know, it, it really became um, quite problematic. So it's kind of it's kind of hard for the Fed after the fact to, to solve the problem. Um, we're and, we're and jumping around that, a little bit, Larry, but I have yeah. a follow up question on that. Like, sure. I'm just looking at the 10 year yield and uh, how, how yeah. much is Powell potentially being pressured by the bond market? Oh, there's no doubt he is. Higher I mean, or even move it higher, right? Yeah, there's there's absolutely no doubt that he is. I mean, look, he cut rates and the bond goes up and the yield on the 10 year goes. I mean, that's they don't like that. That's not good. That's not good at all. Um, the flip of that, though, I mean, if they can if if they can get the stock market to break, and unemployment to go up, you know, there's a pretty decent argument. I was with a smart macro guy earlier this morning talking about it. He said there's a decent argument they'll actually get a, you know, that there'll be a bid to safety yield in the bond and the, and the 10 year rate might come down a bit. Um, I suppose that's possible. I don't know. Um, I think that um, when the stock market breaks and the big print gets announced, the 10 year yield is going much, much higher. You know, that, that, trying to buy bonds right now for a trade because you think the economy is going to slow down or the stock market is going to roll over. It might work, but you're kind of picking up nickels in front of a steamroller. Yeah. Um, now, what I, we're seeing today, Larry, in the market seems like a best end trade or the best end move a little bit. Um, yeah, ten, exactly. ten years come down a little bit. The yield meanings like 4.3 or 4.29. Yeah, uh, S&P stock, broke stock through 6,000. Yep. Yeah, the stock market's up and our shit's getting hammered. So... <laughs> it's, it's just another crazy day you know big yeah, fun, fun times fun, yeah, fun, fun times, times absolutely um are, are you at all worried about a liquidity crisis in the bond market next year because we need to refinance oh, yeah. uh absolutely. a ton of outstanding t-bills absolutely so that's that's my thesis my operating model is that at some time in the next year something breaks and that they just they, they cannot get the bonds sold because everybody knows they've lost control of the inflation picture and um, and so when that occurs, rates will start going higher quickly, and uh, they will need to um, revert to the same old playbook, which will be, you know, stop the QT, which is you know they took QT from sixty down to twenty five, so they'll turn that off, and they'll immediately take interest rates down, and they'll immediately start QE, um, just like they have in the past. Whenever you know, and they'll claim. Hey, it was a liquidity crisis. We had to do it. We recognize there's inflation risk, but you know the fact of the matter is, if we don't do this, the ATMs aren't going to work. I mean, that's always the excuse, right? And uh, and so they'll they'll use that excuse to allow them to print a ton more money, and then those of us who have money, the value of it will all get debased, you know, relative to where it was, right? Buy gold or Bitcoin. But for that matter. And yeah, um, let, let, let's talk about that. Like, sure. Maybe that was uh, the smart segue here to, to throw yeah, sure, going sure. into the conversation, Larry. Um, I'm trying to understand the move. Obviously, a lot of euphoria. Um, the US talking about a Bitcoin reserve, meaning, uh, you know, yeah. a Fort Knox for Bitcoin. I'm not sure what that's going to look like and who's going to run around with the USB stick in their pocket. But um, <laughs> <You're> <laughs> I'm way too pragmatic for that kind of stuff. But um, Give us a bit of an update on Bitcoin. We rarely talk about Bitcoin on this channel. Maybe we'll start from like, give us the cliff notes on why has Bitcoin yeah, moved so well, much? What's you, the background here? Yeah, let me give you the first principles. So, you know, gold is sound money. It's been sound money for 5,000 years and is much more widely distributed and, um, you know, can't be counterfeited or not easily counterfeited. And so, um, you know, and, and you can possess it and so forth, so on and so forth. And so, you know, it's what I call analog sound money. Um Bitcoin, quickly speaking, is digital sound money. It's a what got what happened with Bitcoin is they invented the concept of digital scarcity. If you think about things which are digital, like you know CDs and music and movies and phone call, anything, anything digital, you know, a file with a you know a typewritten file, anything digital can be copied a million times. So there's no there's no scarcity in digital land. It's very easy to you know hit a button and print. I mean, digital dollars, right? Fiat. I mean, they just hit a button and they got more fiat. Um, what Bitcoin did was they solved the problem of creating something where they created digital scarcity. And so they've got an algorithm and a system that's distributed 20,000 nodes around the world, a bunch of miners who process the, the transactions where there's legitimate digital scarcity. There will only be 21 million Bitcoins ever. 
that's the system and it's it's hard coded and changing it's almost virtually impossible now at this stage in its life so so what you've got is is a is a digital form of something that'll be scarce which is called one bitcoin and you know i liken it to digital gold um it's it's you know and and obviously the value of place to it is all a function of the marketplace but the marketplace you know as menger said money is the most liquid thing the marketplace looks at what's money and tries to looks at the characteristics of any sort of money or asset and and then places a value on it right now the value of bitcoins in the ninety thousand dollar range it started off much lower um and money in my view has always been a ledger you know before gold even existed people kept score by putting marks on the walls of caves so you know money is just a social obligation that says i owe you this or you owe me that and uh, so it doesn't necessarily have to be a physical thing like gold as peter schiff contends um, but it can be. And so that's that's kind of the, the, the brief summary. Um, and, you know, a lot of people have gotten thrown off the track because of all the other cryptos are all total bullshit. And there's a lot of fraud and Sam Bankman Freed and everything else. But Bitcoin's actually a technological innovation that people should study. So starting from that as a first principle, um, Bitcoin's got one advantage over gold, and that is gold is widely distributed. It's been around 5,000 years. It doesn't go up very rapidly because everyone who wants to own it already owns it or has known about it for a long time. Bitcoin's one of those things where almost nobody knew about it 10 years ago, and more people know about it now, but you know, still the percentage of people who own it is quite small. And so it's if it's growing into a form of money, and I believe it is, um, and more and more people are coming to see that the properties that it has are valuable. And I think that's occurring. You can see the evidence of that. Then you've got more people competing for the same number of coins outstanding. So there are 46 million millionaires in the world. There are 21 million Bitcoins. So every millionaire cannot own one Bitcoin. And yet you can buy a Bitcoin for 97,000 right now. So, um, so what I would contend is that Bitcoin is going to continue to become more valuable. Now, the price you pay for that asymmetric upside is the fact that at, because it's an emerging asset, it's extremely volatile and it's had four drawdowns of well over 50 percent. And so when you buy it, you have to understand that you, you know, any, but, however, I'll say that. But then I'll also say that anyone who's hold for more than four years is ahead. So it goes through these cycles where it runs really hard and then it corrects and then it runs really hard and then it corrects. And each run takes it to a new all time high. And each correction doesn't come down as far as the last low, but it comes down quite a bit. So my view is what's probably going to happen on this cycle, based on prior cycles and percentages and everything else, is we started this cycle at about 50,000. I think we'll probably run up to about 200,000 sometime in the next year or two. And then we'll have everyone will be levered up and talking about how Bitcoin's going to gazillions of dollars and overexcited, all that other stuff. And then it'll correct. <laughs> And it'll come from 200 back to 100. Um, and that'll be a good time to buy it again. And then the next cycle, you know, the last, low, last cycle low was after Sam Bankman Fried. It was at 15. I was buying it there. I'm really glad I did. You know, it's at 90 <laughs> something now. Bought it at 15. So this pattern, I think, will continue to present itself. The, the drawdowns are becoming slightly slower, lower with each cycle. It doesn't draw down quite as much. Um, so the volatility is decreasing over time as more and more people understand it. I don't know if it's happened in the Europe, but in the United States, a big deal over here is that the ETFs, you know, when I, when I was trying to tell friends about it, one of their first concerns was, well, that's not going to work. The government's going to ban this thing. They're going to realize it's a threat to fiat currency. They're not going to let you keep it. And that could still occur at some point in the future if we had a democratic government and democratic administration. But when the U.S. approved the ETFs, that was a big deal. I mean, the U.S. SEC said, hey, it's a commodity. You guys can own it. Well, that that really changed the landscape of it. So I believe we're in a multi-decade decade process of it becoming an important asset to own. It's a digital asset and we live in a digital world and it's important to own. It's scarce, 21 million. So I, I fully accept, expect that you know, and there are a lot of models that I could talk about that show this, that in, you know, a number of years, this will be a million dollars a coin. And perhaps in 20 some odd plus years, it could be $10 million a coin, which is kind of crazy right now because you can buy a coin for, you know, $95,000 or $96,000. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, the obvious question to follow up here, Larry, is, uh, is, is Bitcoin taking butter off gold's bread? Is, uh, 
Yeah, it's yeah, a are great we seeing question. competition here? Like, yeah. it, it feels like it's not binary. It's it's a, it's very binary. It's not block. binary. It's either gold or Bitcoin, right? Yeah, it's, it's either not gold binary. Or Bitcoin. A For lot me, it's of gray. Per- a lot of people own both, and and yes, certainly to a degree. I mean, I think the younger generation, you know, is is tending towards Bitcoin versus gold. Um, I think the older generation still buy gold. I think central banks still buy gold. I think you know, um, people in India buy gold and China buy gold. I mean, Bitcoin is still it's still very early days. I mean, let, just to put it in relative market terms, um, the total available Bitcoin today is worth just under $2 trillion at today's price. The total available gold on the planet is $16 trillion. So, you know, um, if, if Bitcoin has sucked off two out of 16, you know, of demand, I mean, how much does that really damage gold? I mean, I, you know, my view is they are both going to work. And either one is a good sound money investment, but that if you can stand the volatility and if you understand what you're doing, that there's more upside optionality in Bitcoin than there is in gold. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it's, and, and over time, yeah, it, it could steal gold's thunder. I mean, you know, it's not as bad as, as cars and horses, but I'm trying to think of another analogy that's, I don't know, it's, it, but, but, you know, there is, you know, it's an older gold is an older form of money, very sound, very proven. And Bitcoin is a newer form of money. No. The other risk in Bitcoin is just the existential risk that the whole network blows up and it doesn't work. I don't think that's a very big risk after 15 plus years and 900,000 block or 870,000 blocks. But it's not a zero risk. I mean, I own them both and a lot of both of them. So, um, you know, I, I think they each fill slightly different roles. So. You there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Uh, it just froze for a second. But yeah, uh, froze. it's like whatever scammer is behind Bitcoin, and I'm, I'm saying that loosely, by the way, so don't crucify me in the comments, but uh, it's definitely playing a very long game here. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, very, very <laughs> much so. I mean, you know, and they, yeah, and there are, look, there are a lot of crazy promoters. There have been scam artists. I mean, a lot, most of the scammers in the crypto space are non Bitcoin people. I mean, Sam Bankman Freed was FTX and you know, he had paper Bitcoin. He told people they had Bitcoin. He never bought it. He just put it in there. He said it was in their account. And it wasn't. No. Um, you know, they're, they're, I'm a very much I'm very much a Bitcoin maximalist and I'm very negative on the other cryptocurrencies, mainly because they don't have proof of work and their monetary policies change. I mean, you know, the, the again, the thing that Bitcoin did was it created digital scarcity, secure digital scarcity, which is immutable. It can't be changed. And that's a big deal. Um no other crypto really has that. And certainly no, no other crypto has that with the same network size. I mean, you know, the, the, when I was at the show, this gold show this past weekend, Peter Schiff said, well, you know, you, you can't touch it, feel it, use it for anything else. He's right. I mean, it's a, it's a ledger entry. It's an immutable ledger entry. But I, you know, I think money is a ledger, not, you know, you don't have to be able to make it bounce off a table like a gold coin. Um, you know, the, the, um, so that's so that's one of the negatives. The other negative he pointed out, he said, well, you could start up another one. You know, there are a gazillion cryptos. And who's to say that, you know, crypto number ABC doesn't come in and be better. than And to that, I would say, well, OK, I get it. In the early days, that was certainly a risk. But, you know, you'd have to have some characteristics that made it, quote unquote, better than Bitcoin for people to go there. And, and also, more likely, the issue really there is there's this enormous network flywheel effect. I mean. And, and don't get me wrong, this could occur, but it's, you know, it'd be like saying somebody's going to create a search engine and just wipe out Google. Do you know what I mean? And yet, because of the network effect of Google, the fact that, you know, everyone uses Google and therefore everyone wants to sell on Google and everyone wants to go, you know, I mean, it's just, it, you know, network effects are really, really strong. And, uh, you know, Bitcoin is orders of magnitude bigger than every other cryptocurrency. Well, maybe not orders of magnitude on Ethan, Ethereum, but basically all the small, all the, all the other ones. And so, you know, it's going to be very hard to tear down and change that network effect, in my opinion. Yeah. Is that like a beta max versus VHS discussion we're having here? Or is there uh, a little bit, there actually... mean, a little bit, but they were earlier on and they weren't deep into the network. Um, you know, I prefer it more along the lines of, you know, we're Netflix and, and you know, um, you know, Ethereum gold is blockbuster. Is, yeah, they're <laughs> blockbuster. I mean, you know, we, we got a digital solution to to an analog problem. What used to be an analog problem. So, um, you know, I mean, it, it, the I, the one that other people use as well is this 
is this Facebook to MySpace, you know, um, because MySpace was an early precursor to Facebook. And, you know, I would say, yeah, you know, look, there's a time when, when that was a risk, you know, when Bitcoin was small and there were other things competing for the attention of people. But now that Bitcoin's a $2 trillion network with hundreds of millions of users and, you know, I mean, ter terawatts of power being applied to this network, I think it's unlikely that somebody else is going to create an alternative that's going to supplant it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's yeah, we're just way down. We're just way down the road, you know. Yeah. So now it's like video disc versus DVD or Blu-ray versus others. So yeah, HD, I, HD it's a, DVD or and, whatever and it, it was. And it's and it's <laughs> and look, the thing that people buy money for, they, they look at its properties. I mean, I can move a billion dollars. I can store it in my head with twelve words. You know, there's. I mean, I mean, another way of looking at this thing kind of, that I think is very interesting. If you think about money from the beginning of time, every form of money has been dilutable. I mean, there's, and even gold is dilutable. Only 1.7% a year gets added to the underlying base, but it, but that's something. And Bitcoin right now, only 0.8 gets added to the underlying base. And every four years, that cut, gets cut in half. So it'll be 0.4 and then 0.2 and then 0.1, you know, eventually uh, there's effectively no dilution. So what's the value of a kind of money with zero dilution? I mean, we, we really don't know. We've never had one before, you know? And so, <laughs> And I think that's part of what makes this thing so interesting. And it makes me think about how high is up. And I, you know, I was at the show and I talked about how I think this thing could go from 90 some odd thousand to, a, you know, to a million. And then I think it'd go to 10 million. And I, I heard a couple of the older people in the front row scoffing like that's ridiculous. And, um, but I, but I don't think they're necessarily thinking through, you know, the implications, um, you know, I'm sure, I mean, I bought Microsoft it's split adjusted now at six cents a share and now it's at 400. You know, I mean, it's, uh, it's when you, when you get in network, when you get something that has it, you know, or Google was up, you know, 2000% from its IPO price. When you get something that is a leading network thing, it can become extremely valuable. It's kind of a different paradigm. And, um, um, you know, I mean, think about it. in the history of investing, there aren't that many things that have returned more than 100 times your money. And yet the three biggest networking businesses have all returned thousands of times your money in under 20 years. I'm referring to Amazon, Google and Facebook, you know. And so here we've got a monetary network business with a limited supply and, and all those could issue stock. They, did, they didn't because they had positive cash flow. But here we've got a limited supply of stock, i.e. Bitcoins, and we've got a monetary network that's growing. I mean, these things are going to go up in price a lot. <laughs> that's my belief. Yeah, automatic moats. Right? Yeah, it is. It, there is a moat there. So, so it, you know, to me, it's the best asymmetric bet I've seen in 43 years of investing. But like I say, I haven't given up my gold because, you know, I, I have a really good friend. He said, gold is a CDS on Bitcoin's failure, right? I mean, you know, a CDS is a credit default swap, right? And so if Bitcoin doesn't work, you want to own a ton of gold. So. No, you want to own gold anyway. But uh, of course you, of maybe, course you maybe do, a bit I'm of a saying. summary question for you to sort yeah. of put that. Everything we've just discussed, um, sort yeah. of in, a, in an overview. If you were to invest a million dollars right now, Larry, how, how would you allocate that capital? Oh, that's a great question. Well, there's not much value in the stock market. There's zero value in the bond market. All those sovereign bonds are going to, you know, I think, I think credit... I think, I think there's a high probability that the currencies and credit are going to get destroyed. We live in an everything bubble that's sovereign debt and currencies and credit. So zero to bonds, um, whatever real estate you need to live in. But I wouldn't generally pick real estate as a good investment because of the taxes associated with it. So that really leaves you with the stock market, gold and silver and Bitcoin. Um, I think the stock market is extraordinarily overvalued. I mean, there are pockets of value, maybe some of the commodity producers, but Generally speaking, I'd give the stock market a 0% allocation just because of its overvaluation. So now you're down to gold and silver and Bitcoin. And I think that I'm, I'm not going to entirely answer your question because um, <laughs> I'm older and, and, you know, I view it a certain way. But and I think everybody has to make their own decision. But um, I would certainly have at least half of my allocation in Bitcoin. And um, and I think younger people, perhaps more and older people, perhaps less. With the alternative, you know, so so gold, silver, Bitcoin, you know, I, I, I mean, I think you'd be nuts not to have 10 percent allocation in Bitcoin. Just nuts. Any gold holder should sell 10 percent of their gold and buy Bitcoin. There's so much asymmetry. Um, 
And in turn, you know, if you're a young person and you don't care about the volatility, you can take a long-term view. Maybe you should have 90% in Bitcoin and 10% in gold. I mean, I, if you look at historically, go to my Twitter feed and look at the chart from New Orleans, you know, gold is crushing Bitcoin, the performance. I mean, the, you know, this is the thing I say to, and I said it to Peter Schiff. I mean, these numbers, you know, it, it's outperforming your thing by a lot. So, okay, you know, just, that's a fact. That's not an opinion. That's just a fact. Okay. So <laughs> if that's a fact, explain to me why that's going to change. If you can explain to me with a really cogent logical argument, why that's going to change. All right. Well then maybe I, you know, maybe I should up my gold allocation or, or, you know, or if you say to me, Hey, I can't handle the volatility. I don't want to live through a 50% trot on. Great. I get it. Okay. Don't, you know, but, but, you know, most people, if they put 10% of their wealth into something and it draws down 50%, that's not going to wipe them out. You know, that's a 5% hit to their wealth. And, you know, as I said earlier, if you can hang on for four years in every four year cycle, Bitcoin has gone on to hit a new high. And I think that's going to continue until I see something that suggests that something has changed. So, um, you know, I think Bitcoin will outperform gold. I mean, I know a lot of your gold listeners probably don't want to hear that, but it's been outperforming gold. And so, you know, what I've tried to do, my role in this whole thing, is I've tried to orange pill, which is convert people to big gold holders. I basically said, hey, you know, open up your mind. I, I you know, and I, a lot of gold people are, you know, they're angry because they had they had it right. They've got the macroeconomics right. They got the Austrian theory right. And they hate this new thing, you know, they, and they and they see a lot of fraudsters. They see a lot of promotion. They see a lot of bullshit. And that just rubs them the wrong way. I get it. I completely get it. But look beyond all that and just factually look at what it is. And, you know, I would think that based on that and based on the performance, based on the asymmetry, you might want to get some. You know? And how much some is, well, that's everybody makes their own choice. You know, but I, 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 I've said to clients, the only wrong choice in Bitcoin, only wrong allocation in Bitcoin is zero. And get something yeah. because if you do zero and it goes up 100 X, you're going to have regret. I mean, I've noticed I've been investing for 40 plus years and I've got regret about certain things I missed and certain things I didn't do. And so, you know, but everybody's got 100, you know, 100 chips to make a bet with. So, you know, if, if you think something might really work, and it looks attractive. Fine. Take two chips and put 2 percent into it. If you're wrong, you lose 2 percent. Yeah. If you're right and it goes up 200 percent, you're going to be really glad you did it. Yeah, you know, that's how you avoid yeah. regret, right? Absolutely. Diversi Get past the island boys and uh, buy some. Yeah, Diver yeah, right. Yeah, yeah those guys. <laughs> yeah, diversif diversification, right? That's I guess that's what I'm arguing for is diversification. No, nah, that's a really good point, Larry, to end on as well. Um, yeah. where, where can we follow your work? It's yeah, been so extremely um, insightful. as you know, I make a lot of noise on Twitter. I don't like the central bankers. I think they've ruined our world. I'm a very big sound <laughs> money advocate. That's uh it's a big piece of what I'm all about. Um, I also have, so you can see me there just under my name, Lawrence Lepard. Um, I'm, I also have a website, ema2.com is the website, Equity Management Associates. You can Google it and find it. I read a, my partner and I, David Foley, we write a quarterly newsletter um, and we talk about macro events, basically what we've been discussing here, but we update it every quarter so you can see our current thoughts. And then finally, I'll make a pitch. Um, I'm in the process of writing a book um, and the book is going to be about sound money and about inflation and about how the societal troubles that we're having now, in my opinion, are, are driven. It was a lot of political strife and turmoil. And uh, my opinion, that's all being driven by the fact that we don't have sound money. When we went off the gold standard in 71, that was an enormous mistake and a big crime. And that's the problems from associated with that have compounded over the 53 years since we did it. And um, the, if we want to return to a, healthy and sound and fair economy, we've got to go back to some form of sound money. And so the book is going to try and lay that out in terms and explanation that anyone can understand. It's not going to be, you know, deep finance, highly technical, et cetera. It's going to be really simple, you know, that, that this is the problem, folks, and here's how we fix it. So what's the release date, Larry? Uh, the release date is in the first quarter. I, I'm writing it now. It's all, it's done, but I'm, it's amazing how hard it is to edit it and polish it. I'm hoping to have it final in mid-December, which means it'll probably be out January, February, kind of March, worst case. And it'll be on Amazon and there'll be an audio and Kindle and all that kind of stuff. So, Are you going um, to read it for us? Uh, pardon me? Uh, am Are I going to read it? I don't it? know. I, you know. Ultimately, yes, maybe. It takes a lot of time to do that audio recording. I've, 
I may have a guy start off and do it before I, if I don't have time to get to it, but somebody will do it. Cause I, you know, this is a shocking fact I've learned from publishers and stuff. About 50% of books now are sold as audiobooks. You know, people oh, really? aren't reading, people aren't getting hard copy books and reading them as much. They're listening to them. So interesting. I didn't Isn't know that. that interesting? Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Awesome. Larry, tremendous pleasure to have you back on the program. Oh, thanks. We'll get you back I, like when I, the said, I always enjoy being with you. So I hope, I hope it pro provided some value and helped you out. <laughs> oh, a hundred percent. A hundred percent. Thank you so much, Larry okay, and thanks, uh, everybody else. Thank you so much for tuning in here to soar financially. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Larry as much as I have. I've learned, I always learn something new this time. We focus a bit more on Bitcoin than usual because it's an area that I don't really follow too closely. As Larry said, I should probably way more. I don't own any Bitcoin, so I'm missing out on a lot here. Oh, you got to get um, some. <laughs> I know, I know. I need to figure out a way to do it and to give, throw it some, at least some into the portfolio. But then again, I look at the price, Larry. Maybe it's the same with gold. It feels like it's already too expensive. But you know. a really good case. Yeah, I know. I know. But the, you know, Microsoft or, or Amazon, all those things. They, you know, these network businesses, they always feel too expensive. That's why I missed them. I kept. Yeah. I, I looked at Amazon, Microsoft a million times. I kept thinking, how do I pay this much for it? You know, and, and, and you think, oh, gee, gee, Larry, you bought yours for 9000 It's 90 I can't do that. Well, you know, in seven or 10 years, it's going to be 900 And people are going to say, you paid 90 <laughs> Holy cannoli, you got a really good deal. I mean, yeah. it's, 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 it's going to, you know, it's just, if a business is growing at a compound, if a value is growing at a compound rate every year, you know, 30% plus, which this thing is, you know, you'll, there's, there's, I mean, look, one could say that if you want to buy it, you know, it, you know, you might, you don't put all your money into it today at 90, you buy half of it and hope there's a pullback and then you buy the other half. Yeah, but, dollar cost um, average, I think is that. Yeah, and dollar cost average into it. But there's, you know, again, once again, I say, you don't want to have zero because what are you going to do if we wake up and I mean, a year from now, in my view, it actually could be at 200. And then you're going to think, well, shit, I should have bought it at 90. <laughs> you know? yeah. So, right. So, you know, you just gotta, you gotta get, you gotta get started somewhere and, and then figure out what you do as, as, as time goes by. No, oh, fantastic. Um, if you own Bitcoin, if you own gold, if you own both, put that down below. I'm really curious. I can't really put a poll below the video, but I'm curious, uh, would, would you respond to uh, in the comments down below? Let us know. And if you haven't done so, cause I roughly know 80% of you haven't subscribed to this channel. It's a free way to support us and we tremendously appreciate it. Go check out Larry's uh, Twitter feed. Go check out Larry's website, of course, as well. I'm really looking forward to seeing his book come out here in the first quarter of 2025. We'll get him back on before then. We'll have to discuss the outlook for 2025 a little bit. What are his predictions uh, besides $200,000 Bitcoin? And uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll have to look at some of the macro policy. It's not just $200,000 Bitcoin, by the way. I think it's about $4,000 gold next year. So the, Oh, there we go. You really like take... to hear that. And $50 silver. So we're, you know, we're going a lot higher in these things. Oh, absolutely. If, if, if it all plays out the way we all sort of predict, then uh, there's no way around it. I, yeah, I, exactly. I absolutely think so. No, everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back with lots more here on Sword Financial. Thank you. Thank you.